You've heard of ghost towns, but there's a ghost city in Nebraska. Come with us now as we discover Nebraska's ghost city. This is Midwest Ghost Town. Nebraska, a state entrenched in its own mysterious beauty. One that surprises and catches you off guard. One with the wild temperament of the Great Plains. And one with the wild traces of nature, like the rolling Missouri. Along with the wildness of Nebraska, followed the wildness of its citizens, its people, the early settlers of the day, and the pioneers of this country. Many seeking their very first opportunity to own their own land. And along these same opportunities were the very first communities, towns, and many on paper, and dreaming of the day that they might get platted and boom or bust into their own making. The dream of planting a village and growing it into a town and eventually having it take a life of its own into a living, breathing city is part of the story of expansion and the westward movement. Stories of the Transcontinental Railroad, homesteaders, and gold rushers. One of those pioneers was John Evans, a popular, wealthy figure from Illinois. First a physician, then evolving into one of the founding fathers of Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. Not surprisingly, a town named in Evans' honor. But there was something more to John Evans. He believed in the promising investment of the American railroad system. And he ultimately believed in the possibility of a transcontinental railroad. In 1855, when Nebraska's governor, Tom Cooming, highlighted the point that there needed to be a railroad that crossed the state of Nebraska, opportunity rang in the ears of John Evans, who wanted to build a railroad city, a town that ushered in the light of a new day, with the progression of the Transcontinental Railroad, and history giving a smiling nod to the progressiveness. He chose the location at the confluence of the Platte and Missouri Rivers which made sense given the population already existing around the area, steamboat traffic, and major area for travelers to rest and pre prepare for further westward movement. Not only did he have the area picked out, but his vision was big. Preparing the new town as a 276 block lots and holding thousands of lots, one including a railroad depot, several schools, a university, and one of them being a Methodist seminary. All in all, roughly over a 13 square mile area. And he named it Oreopolis. But Evans' plan came to a screeching halt when in 1857, an economic crisis led to the shutdown of many banks. However, this did not derail Evans or his plans for Oreopolis. He continued to buy while prices were low and expand his territory of ownership. In 1858, people began to trickle into the town, buying lots and businesses. All the while, Evans continued to use his outside influence and grow Oreopolis, calling it, quote, the most eligible route for a railroad. A year later, in 1859, the population was only 187. It just was not catching on. While next door, Plattsmouth and Omaha grew in comparison, threatening the town's survival. But there was an even larger doomsday even unfolding, the American Civil War. Iowa, sitting to the east of Nebraska, had all railroad construction come to a halt as all of the state's attention, manpower, and resources were directed towards the war efforts, instead of westward expansion. This crippled Evans as he was buying time to have the railroad completed, bringing traffic and opportunity to Oreopolis. Even this did not stop Evans in his pursuit of the railroad, and his aspirations of public office as a Nebraska governorship loomed. He had large political connections, especially with his good friend, President Abraham Lincoln, 
who appointed the governors of territories at the time. If he could earn the governor position from Lincoln, he would be in a good position to favor Oriopolis. But instead, Lincoln appointed him governor of the Colorado Territory. And this was the beginning of the end for the soon-to-be ghost town. Evans began to lose interest in his own town, started looking in other areas for his transcontinental railroad dreams. Oriopolis citizens felt betrayed and disheartened with Evans as he began to show abandonment. With a community he had once made bold promises about, soon the Methodist Conference joined in that sentiment and pulled their support of the seminary, which forced its closing. Not far behind, in 1864, the post office closed, marking the death of Oriopolis. We'll be right back. This is Midwest Ghost Town. Hey there, this is Dan with Midwest Ghost Town. Do you like content like this? Just want to encourage you to follow along if you like it. Just hit the subscribe button and join the conversation if you're interested by dropping a comment. Let's discuss history and learn together. So we've been covering the ghost town of Oriopolis and specifically its founding father, John Evans. And John Evans, from this point, moved out to Denver as a newly appointed governor and turned his attention to growing that city, including Denver University. Basically at that point forward, Evans basically built the same dream vision he had for Oriopolis, but with Denver instead. This is where the story twists, but for the sake of telling history, here is that story. John Evans heads west to Colorado, and becomes the territory's second governor in 1862, and turns his attention to the railroad completion from Denver to Salt Lake City. So basically, he picks up where he left off, only this time out in Colorado. But the thing that became the most divisive with Evans was with the Plains Indians and the Sand Creek Massacre. By 1864, people in Denver began to fear what the Indians were building up to overtake the city. In response, Evans, as acting governor, issued a proclamation in August 1864 that authorized all citizens of Colorado to go in pursuit of all hostile Indians and kill and destroy all enemies of the country. His reasoning, of course, because of the lack of the ability to defend Denver, because what was going on at the time is that the men were off fighting in the Civil War. They weren't there to defend Denver. Evans ordered that so-called friendly Indians should present themselves to various forts for their safety and protection. And those who did not were hostile and should be pursued and destroyed. At that point, along comes a new character, Chief Black Kettle. Chief Black Kettle was part of a tribe known as Buffalo People and was a band within the Cheyenne. He had told Native Americans at that time that it was important that they make peace with the settlers or they would be crushed. In fact, he was so concerned that Chief Black Kettle demanded that he speak with President Abraham Lincoln. He met with Lincoln and was very proud to have been given a large American flag in the fall of 1864. Only a few Native Americans, including Black Kettle, accepted Evans' offer of amnesty. The deal was Evans told them just to fly the American flag and white flag from your teepee. In doing so, you would signal to him that you meant peace and you meant no harm and that they would leave you alone. But while Evans was away on a political trip, on November 29, 1864, Colonel Chivington ordered 700 cavalry troopers to attack Black Kettle's peaceful encampment when most of the men were away hunting. Black Kettle flew an American flag and a white flag from his teepee at that moment, but the signal was ignored. The 3rd Colorado Cavalry killed 163 Cheyenne by shooting or stabbing. They burned down the village encampment, and most of the victims were women and children. For months afterward, members of the militia displayed trophies in Denver of their battle, including body parts that they had taken for souvenirs. 
Upon Evans' return from his political trip, he decorated Chivington and his men for their valor in subduing the savages. Black Kettle escaped the massacre and returned to rescue his severely injured wife who suffered nine bullet wounds. He continued to counsel pacifism during the whole phase believing that military resistance was doomed to fail, but the majority of the Southern Cheyenne chiefs disagreed and allied with the Comanche and the Kiowa and they went to war against the U.S. Black Kettle said at that time, although wrongs have been done to me, I live in hopes. A year later, two U.S. congressional committees and one military committee were formed to investigate the massacre. Finding guilty on the part of the U.S. government in 1865, Evans was accused of a cover-up. He was forced to resign as governor in 1865, and Chivington's political ambitions were ruined. All this was known as the Sand Creek Massacre. After the massacre happened, Attacks continued from the other tribes and younger scouts from Black Kettle's camp. In response to this, and the continued raids and massacres, General Philip Sheridan devised the plan. He planned to attack Cheyenne winter encampments, destroying supplies, their livestock, killing people who resisted, and at dawn on the morning of November 27, 1868, just two days short of the fourth anniversary of the Sand Creek Massacre, Lieutenant George Armstrong Custer led his 7th Cavalry Regiment to attack Chief Flat Kettle and his village along the Washita River in what is now western Oklahoma. Custer troops killed more than 100 Native Americans, mostly Southern Cheyenne. While trying to cross the Washita River, Black Kettle and his wife were shot in the back and killed. Following the event, Colonel Edward Wincoop Indian agent for the Cheyenne and the Arapaho at Fort Larne, Kansas, interviewed Little Rock. He was a chief of Black Kettle's Cheyenne village. According to Little Rock's account, a war party of about 200 Cheyenne from a camp about the forks of the Walnut Creek departed camp intending to go out against the Pawnee. Instead, they raided white settlements along the Saline and Solomon Rivers. According to Little Rock, most of the warriors came back to Black Kettle's camp after their attacks. White prisoners, including children, were held within his encampment. By this time, Black Kettle's influence was waning, and it was unclear whether he could have stopped the younger warrior's actions. Here we are, at the crossroads of history. We uncover the story of what I'm calling Nebraska's Ghost City, but it's connecting dots with other stories in history. I give an analogy like this, it's like discovering a tunnel and seeing where it leads. And then you find yourself entrenched in a massive mine and a story or two later, and the only way out is to tell the story. Write the complete story, the unknown story, sometimes the story that we don't want to tell, but we end up needing to tell it. Nebraska's ghost city of Oreopolis. John Evans, Chief Black Kettle and the Sand Creek Massacre. All history, but not forgotten. This is Midwest Ghost Town.